stands as recalcitrant children, lapsed adolescents, not quite up to the tasks of adulthood. As people who can contribute or contrive little but the sure thing of fresh ways of failing. I'm overstating, but you get the point. And I guess there's a final reason while I'm here. I teach the book, and for the last several years, rough cuts of the film, too, to second and third year law students. On most such occasions, we've had the distinct honor of being joined by the quietly authoritative voice of Sidewalk's lead character, Hakim Hassan, who also serves, as you remember, as the kind of guide to literary Greenwich Village at the outset of the film. Here's what usually happens. The students watch the film, are blown away by this not so simple trick of watching a familiar scene unfold almost origami-like into a full-fledged way of life and jurisprudence. These are law students, after all. And then they start throwing questions. Hakeem and Mitch will field the question, look pensive, answer the simple ones, and then go sphinx-like over the hard ones and ask the students what they think. That technique, that method, I think, is built in to the film itself. A New Yorker, even a transplant like myself, enters the world of sidewalk, an anthropologist on the home front, curious, but also claiming a stake, an interested native and a part of these things, not simply for the insubordinate thrill of bucking convention and peering in on disorderly alternative realities. The moral job of ethnography, Clifford Geertz spent a lifetime arguing, is to show us how others do the hard stuff. The better to appreciate the contingency, the less than divinely ordained status of our own enforced traditions and limited lines of sight. Said differently, the documentary project can have pragmatic and not simply archival value. Robert Cole's writing of James Agee, but thinking of a lot of us engaged in this same work, noted, like him, we founded ourselves better at realizing what isn't working than at finding out what might work. Sidewalk, a gamble that paid off, is a late-breaking, unlikely attempt at the latter, at what might work. But note Cole's conditional. The odds and enabling circumstances are what we should be worried about, and Sidewalk gives us good reason to do so. In the language of historical sociology, the men and women of Sixth Avenue have contrived a sort of rough cut abeyance mechanism. Work, conviviality, protocols for ongoing negotiations with the powers that be, a de facto, if shifting and unruly, intentional community with a record of useful enterprise, neighborhood sufferance, and rehabilitative promise. If nothing else, the achievement, or the provisional achievement, gives the lie to the offer of public shelter, which, as Lee, Sing Lee Stringer has shown, has become so much an extension of the neoliberal state that its disciplinary demands far outweigh the paltry offer of a bed for the night. The bed, the courts have ruled, is free. Clients nonetheless pay for shelter in installments of shame and servility. The low-grade surveillance, lowering routines, and the least common denominator assumptions made about the men and women who use them. There's a logic to this, of course. Forewarned or newly apprised of the price of shelter will be reckoned in the currency of self-respect, many men will elect to shift for themselves in the uncertain terrain of the street. For some, like Stringer, this will prove redemptive. Stringer binged, slept rough, landed a part-time job that allowed him to sleep on the floor of the office at night, and eventually wrote his way off the street. But of the vast majority of those who find the entry fee too steep, we simply have no idea. Though the city estimates that thousands of them may be bedded down on the street in the dead of winter, my guess is that most of them are neither ignorant of nor inexperienced in the storied mercies of public shelter. The street offers another way. And Sidewalk captures that vital experiment and its own redemptive promise in all its improvised, uneven, and reckless glory. It locates a naked stage in full public view where something original and participatory is taking place. Governance cannot be delegated. Disputes are settled face to face. 
Reputation is collateral, and second chances the order of the day. It's an opportunity made possible by the intricate dovetailing of this marginal niche with the excesses, the waste, the unmet needs, and untested limits of the mainstream. It's an opportunity to take part in the ancient game of truck and barter, the aboriginal dealings of a small society in the making. What does shelter offer? Suspect entry, a badly policed bed, and the nagging insistence and pressure that you devise an independent living plan. Relief programs are all about structure and bending to rules. The street, with its rough, weirdly green, Pirates of, Venice, of Greenwich Village capitalism, is in almost textbook Smithian fashion about the moral obligations of membership and trade. But it's still a gamble, and far from a sure one. Half the men, as the closing comment in the film notes, 15 years later, are still working the street. But four or five have made it out. For every Hakim who leaves to inaugurate a collegiate level series of dialogues in urban life, there's a Ron, deported for yet another drug arrest, now a wraith living in the functional equivalent of an outhouse and scrounging for his living. The street's promise exists thanks largely to an informal order of trade, neighborhood sufferance again, and a work ethic that would have done, done Weber proud. But its rehabilitative program is not exactly evidence-based, and outcome studies are few. So why do I make so much of it at the risk of overselling? I've ha had to think a good deal about this, and I think it's because of its refusal to give up on these guys, their own worth, worst instincts, recurring failure, and shaky inertia notwithstanding. It's a way of life and livelihood with a built-in bailout clause, the standing offer of something better. Not a sure thing, but a constant prospect. There's another subtler letter here, lesson here as well. Documentary, Coles writes, elicits the interests of others and prompts them to do the necessary work of revising their own standard accounts of how the world works by providing a context and showing how an incident is connected to conditions that inform and prompt its occurrence. Okay, this is no more than sociology 101, you say? Yes, but for non-majors. A successful documentary effort ensnares its reader or viewer, trapping them in this alternative version of connectedness and durably altering what were once settled truths. But it doesn't provide a substitute. It installs anxiety instead. And this is critical, it seems to me, to its pedagogical task. Now, a confession. In, discussion, in discussions after the first viewing of this, of a rough cut of the film, I kept pressing for a clearer message, a morality lesson with unmistakable political overtones. Hakeem, Mitch, and Kim Chisholm, the film's editor, kept resisting. I gave up chastened when Kim turned to me and said, I can't believe that as a teacher you're asking us to simplify the story. She was right. Unlike a scholarly production, the documentary is intended to provoke. Unfinished by design, it is deliberately crafted as a corrective, but one that will do its most important wor work off stage. It succeeds when it creates a disposition to think differently about the commonplace when it so unsettles one's reflex account that you can't help but work for something more, more accommodating in the event more complex. This is why I make so much of Sidewalk's brief teaching record to work to date. In the aftermath of the viewing, the students' labor to come to terms with all that it forces up for question is unmistakable. The film is perhaps most eloquent about time and its passage. For all its hazards and for all their sins, it can't help but celebrate the eventfulness of the street for its denizens and the pull it continues to exert for some, like Alice, who leave it. Its silences are eloquent in a different way. There's not too much here that picks up on that national conversation about race announced 10 years ago and two administrations and stillborn from the start. There's that indelible moment 
when a mother realizes that she's entrusted five minutes of her son's welfare to a man whose name she does not know. There's no record of the delicate negotiations between police, police and vendors that keep the, pay, the peace and salvage face. In large measure, one, one suspects, because the camera would have disrupted the process and made it impossible to, to pull off. For these and other reasons, then, there's a necessary incompleteness to the ethnography contained here, an incompleteness that is paradoxically underwritten by the pairing of the film and the text. The film rejoins the narrative, one more set of footnotes, so, sorry, one more set of field notes, it extends the ethnographic present, while at the same time showing us just how fragile and transient all those arrangements and achievements have proven. It makes clear, in a way most accounts imprisoned between book covers do not, that this world continues to evolve and invent, and that little in this embedded outpost is predictable or secure. Mary Douglas has described culture as an argument for a way of life. The achievement of sidewalk, 15 years and counting, you think Mitch is done yet? The text and its companion film is to document the argument in the making and the way of life at issue. But its genius is to make us, readers and viewers alike, parties to the argument, conscripts to its continuance, bearers of its legacy. Jane, Miling, Jane Jacobs is smiling crookedly somewhere. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. I want to begin by asking you, Grady, if you could talk a little bit about your experiences living down in the, in the, in the New York City subway system, which you did for many winters. Uh -huh. Could you begin by just telling us a little bit about how you came to live in the subways? All right. It was a, play, it was a time in my life when uh, I really, really didn't feel too responsible and didn't want no responsibilities. So I feel the place for me to go was on the ground. Yeah, I met okay. this, this young lady, so she took me to a place in the subway. And I realized I seen people with tables, mattress, chairs, and it was on the ground, you know, so I said, oh man, people really living down here. So after that night, I went to another station and I seen, met another guy, and he told me he had this spot in the train station. And so it was like in the winter time, it was cold, so I didn't have nowhere else to go. So I went down there. And I found a little spot, this guy was sleeping like up on some steps, I was sleeping down like in a <laughs> little spot. And I got me a mattress, I got blankets, and I started living down there. And I did it for a while, you know. And the funny thing about that is, you'd be amazed how you can sleep with all that noise from those trains because you'd be very close to the tracks. But you get used to it, you know. And the main thing, you know when the, <coughs> you'll know the time of the day because you'll know how many trains coming and how fast they're coming. You know, when the trains start coming back to back, you know it's either early in the morning or in the afternoon. So that's how I used to know what time it was. During the rush hour, you mean, the right. trains start coming back to back. Yes. So you know it's time to get up. So it's time to go. <laughs> Do a lot of the people who live in the subways work up on the, the streets during the day and then go down there at night? They don't do it no more. This was, this was years ago because... This they, was before 9-11. Right, right. Then there was a lot of people down there. <clears throat> there was a lot of people down there. And what was their daily routine like? Did they go down at night and then come up during the day to work or panhandle? Or did they right. actually... What, did a lot of people stay down there all the time? Basically, what most people did, they would like get up in the morning and go out and do whatever they do to get money or get food or whatever. And when the evening or the nighttime come, and they get cold and they want to rest, they go down and rest. And that's the way it was. It was like going home. But One of the things that I noticed when I was down there with you once was how close the beds were, the mattresses were to the tracks. Um, I mean, very, very, very close. 
Did anybody down there ever get run over by a train during the time you were down there? Not while I was there. Nobody. Not while I was there. Did it feel dangerous to you in other ways? It didn't, I, I wasn't threatened, man. It wasn't dangerous to me. I didn't feel danger. You know. I guess because with me, once I go down now, then I could see. It only takes you a couple of seconds, a few minutes for your eyes to adjust to the darkness, and then if somebody else comes down there, then you'll see them and they couldn't see you, so you don't have to worry about that. You'll be focused, they wouldn't be focused. So you always had ups on whoever coming. So if they didn't get you when you first come, so you didn't have to worry about them. Because you always could see them and they couldn't see you. What about rats? Well, I was never afraid of rats, so I didn't have that problem. But they was there too. <laughs> a lot of them. Man, thing you try to keep food off around you, put your food up or whatever. Me personally, I didn't take food down there because I didn't want the rats crawling over me. That happened a few times too, but I never got bit, so I'm lucky. So you hang the food up? Hang it up, up where rats can't get. Yeah. Doesn't sound that bad the way you're describing it. <laughs> You know, what it could be bad, but then it doesn't sound, it wasn't I mean, that bad not, to me. Yeah. You got used to it, though. You don't have no choice, Mitch. You have no choice. How about you, Warren? Have you ever considered sleeping down there? Nah. I mean, you've, uh, you've slept out on the sidewalk. I, I, I did the subway system, but I stayed on the train. Okay, I didn't go underground. I just, I went underground one time, but not for that, you know. But uh, I mostly, when I, when I was homeless, I mostly rode the E-Train. That was my condominium at the time. You know, I stayed there pretty much. So I go up there, after I, I go upstairs, you know, this when I was selling books with you guys, man, at the time. You know, and I was still homeless, so afterwards, I'd, you know, make some money, get a little medicated, I guess, go get something to eat. And then when I got time, I called myself going home, which was on the E-Train. Last car, left seat on the right. That was me, so. But there have been years, Warren, when you've been out on the sidewalk and you've slept in pretty cold weather out in a chair or you've been out there all night long. Yeah. When you, you could have gone down into the warmth of the subway system. How come you've never chosen to do that? Do, well, you, do you have any idea why? Well, as I said, well, this is a different story with me. Well, I was mostly medicated a lot of those times when I was out in the cold. Okay, I was drunk. I mean, you know, I had a lot of alcohol in me and what have you. So I just put on some layers of coat, and at this time, you could actually still make money two, three o'clock in the morning selling books. I mean, forty, fifty dollar sales. So there was a reason to stay out there. So you just needed some antifreeze, you know, to keep yourself out there, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, to me, it was all right at the time, you know, because you know I had came to the streets, and I didn't, you know, at first I came to the streets, I was shaking a cup, I was actually panhandling. I used to. Uh, my compadres here took me in, and they had this, this, to us it was quite lucrative, <laughs> okay? Uh, we, we used to shake a cup, and then when I first got there, prime time was like between four and eight, so the big boys had that. I had to wait my turn to like 12 or midnight. Tell us how you started out, how you ended up going to the street in the first place. Well, I used to get high, very high. And anyway, I came to a point, my addiction got so bad that uh, my father, he was uh, a president of this double dutch team that they used to go to South Africa, all over the places. They won world championships all over the world. So, and he did. one day he came in the house with like 40 boxes of Nike sneakers, all different sizes for the boys and girls. So, you know, I used to help them, you know, put them in the box, put their names on and everything, lace them up for all the girls. I knew all these people. These were his students? These were his, uh, these wasn't his students, these were uh, his team, his members on his teams that he had. These were kids though? Yeah, these were kids. It was his kids, ages, you know, from 12 to 16. Some even younger than that, seven, eight. Uh, and they used to, you know, go all over the world. They won quite a few, they played prestigious, you know, coming up, American Double Dutch League, if you've ever heard of it. But anyway, make a long story short, I uh, ran out of my money. So I looked at these sneakers and I'm looking at, this is a lot of money. Right here, you know, I could turn into, you know, getting to feed my addiction. So they had to go to South Africa in June. This is around, what, maybe March. I actually 
put myself, believe, actually lied to myself, tell me, yeah, all right, I'm going to sell a box of sneakers, sell another box here, and by June, hopefully, I could get the money together to replace these sneakers. But doing my frenzy and running around, you know, trading these sneakers in for crack or whatever the case may be, I said, wow, this is quite good. So as I got to around May, the end of May, I noticed all these boxes with no sneakers in them. And um, one day I'm at, my, at my, one of my friend's house downstairs. I see all the kids coming in, getting ready to get sides up for their sneakers. I said, oh shit, there's one, excuse me. I said, pops, gonna kill me now. So they came in, I guess. <laughs> my father started handing out the sneakers, and um, there was no sneakers in the, in the boxes. And he found me at my friend's house. He had an iron in his hand. He said, you got five minutes to go downstairs. Here's a bag. Get what you can put in it and get the F out of my house. I said, you serious? He said, I'm going to tell this to you one more time. You got to go. So anyway, that's how I became. I called myself putting what I'm going to put in my bag. So now I used to work at the commodities exchange up in the Wall Street district. So I went up there for about a day or two. I had no means of support, no money. I had to eat, so I went into a restaurant. I sat down, I ordered a nice meal. <coughs> when the check came, I left. You know, it was like that. So then I saw this guy shaking a cup, man. He's getting all this change and whatnot, man. I'm going to the store behind him. He's cashing in like $30, $40 in change. So to me, that was, that was beneath me to do that. But I said it was better than robbing somebody. So I went there and I shook the cup. That's how, I, and I had to get medicated for that. I had to get courage to do that. But then, you know, after a while, that's how I became. And then um, I met a guy named Colorado, God bless the dead, a very good friend of mine. He taught me how to survive on the streets. And he brought me up to West 4th Street. Ergo Grady and these guys. And uh, they was in a bank. Now that's a place to shake a cup, for real, in a bank. ATM. ATM, hmm. okay, so. In about an hour's time, I had the 12 o'clock shift, I think, like from 12 to 2 and in the morning. And you were still able to make $20, $30, which to me was all right, because my means, my means were simple at the time. So that's how I became to the streets. I ripped off my dad, and he threw me out the house pretty much. But we're good now. It took a lot of rebuilding to do that, but, you know, I had to do that. Some people can't come back from things like that. You know, I said I was going to come back and make good with my dad with that. It took a while, but we're here now, so that's all good. What is your relationship like with your family now, Grady? Oh, we good, we good, we good, we good. I got a grandson, I'll be graduating from high school pretty soon. I'm very proud of him. He said he wanted to be a teacher. Tell me he wanted to teach history, and so I'm really happy for him. I'm real proud of him. But I was away from my family for a while too, but that was my choice. I always could have went home, even when I was in the subway. I could always went back to my ex-wife. You know, I always could have went to my mother, but it was my choice to stay to myself.